So, good morning, members. We have a quorum. Can I call the meeting to order? I declare the meeting open to the public. Can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? And may I advise those in the public gallery that mobile devices may be used through a Wi-Fi connection, and all devices should be muted. Password details are set out in the gallery rules for anyone waiting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used, and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. So we have a full committee, and no apologies today. And in terms of chairperson's business, then, myself and the deputy chair met with uh, the deputy chief medical officer, Dr. Chowdhury, this week on Monday ahead of uh, the minister's statement, and he went through a fairly extensive um, information session. The uh, I attended this week, and I know some of the rest of you did as well, actually sponsored the two quite significant <coughs> meetings yesterday, one in the Stormont Hotel and one here in the Long Gallery, around adverse childhood experiences. One was hosted by the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, the other by um, the Safeguarding Board. So I think it's something that is an area of significant importance that I think maybe we should add to the Forward Work Programme. Mm -hmm. Would members be happy that we do that and ask for a briefing on that issue? Okay, thank you. There has also been a number of uh, media um, interviews this week in relation to the coronavirus, and I, I attended uh, the View from Stormont on Monday night. I also done Stormont Live on Tuesday, and I did the Nolan Show last night on, on television. Um, I think it's important that, that everyone who's involved in this is engaging with the public and that the public are made aware of the advice and where to access the correct advice. So I welcome the fact that uh, the Chief Medical Officer has been out and, and done a, a question and answer session. I think that was very useful. Um, in relation to any of that, Pam, or the meeting that we done as Deputy Chair, do you want to anything that you want to flag up? Or? Um. No, not really. I think it just probably the best practice is to share whatever good information we have going forward, because obviously this is, this is an issue that's going to uh, continue for probably a very prolonged period of time, and we'll expect to see an increase in numbers and that. So I think it's good to, to share whatever good practice um, advice is available from the authorities. Yep, thank you. Okay, members, move on there to the draft minutes, and I refer you to the uh, meeting held on the 27th of February, our last meeting, which are pages 6 to 11 of the meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes? Content. content. Um, matters arising. Uh, can I advise members that there are no matters arising from the minutes? So we move on now to the de departmental briefing on reform of adult and social care and the power to people report. Can I advise members that departmental officials are here today to brief the committee on reform of adult and social care and the part of paper report. I refer members to your briefing papers at pages 14 to 167 of the pack. And we are joined now by Mr Sean Holland, Chief Social Worker from the Department of Health, Ms Jackie McElroy, Deputy Chief Social Worker, Department of Health, and Mr. Mark Lee, Director, Mental Health, Disability and Older People uh, in the Department of Health. And I suppose it's, it's a good enough opportunity and time for me to declare my interest up front that I have previously worked as a social worker um, and within, within our trust. So I'd like to welcome you here today and invite you to brief the committee. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good morning. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to brief you on the work we're taking forward in relation to the reform of adult social care. Um, just to elaborate, uh, Mark Lee, who is on my left, is the uh, director in the Department of Health with policy responsibility for adult social care. And Jackie McElroy, who, as you said, chairs the deputy chief social worker, has been leading on developing the response to the report by the expert panel, Power to People. Um, so, with your permission, I'll make an opening statement, uh, and then we'll endeavour to answer your questions. Um, please forgive us if we're a little bit out of practice at this, um, but hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get into the swing quick enough. Um, obviously, if there are any questions you have that we don't feel that we can answer adequately, we'll, we'll follow up um, as quickly as possible in writing with the information that's required. So, um, for many years, the need to reform the health care system in Northern Ireland has been widely acknowledged. 
Uh, for those of us who are old enough to remember, you can go all the way back to the Hayes Review of nearly 20 years ago, through more recent proposals, um, through to the current proposals from Rafa Bengoa. The need to address issues in adult social care is, in my view, just as pressing, but a wider appreciation of that need probably is more recent. One of the reasons um, for the current level of awareness for the need to reform adult social care has probably come from the growing understanding that the ability of the acute health care system, uh, our hospitals, to function effectively is dependent on social care. Without good social care, patients who have completed their treatment but who still require support with activities of daily living cannot be safely discharged. That is certainly one of the reasons why we should value social care, but it is not its purpose. Its purpose is to support people with needs arising from their physical or mental abilities to lead as full and independent lives as possible. Social care promotes and protects the social well-being of people for whom it might be at risk of compromise. I make the point not to be pedantic, but it is to highlight that if we only focus our reforms or the need for reform on effective discharge from hospital, we won't address the totality of social care and we won't address the concerns and hopes of literally the tens of thousands of people who rely on social care for whom hospital discharge is not relevant. Um, so it is important that we realise that while there is an important relationship between social care and acute health care and there are interdependencies, the value of social care goes way beyond getting people out of hospital. So why the need for reform? Probably the biggest single reason is rising demand. Committee members will be very familiar, I'm sure, with the changing demographic uh, nature of our population. Our society is ageing. Uh, by 2028, older people will outnumber children for the first time in Northern Ireland. And the pace of change is accelerating. The demographic ship shift that is happening now in the eight years between 2015 and 2023 will be equal to the change in the 40 years prior to that. And while adults of all ages use and rely on social care, the older population account for about 62% of adult social care expenditure. Assuming that we continue to respond to the need for social care in the same way as we do today, that would mean, for example, that the number of care, package would have, care packages would have to increase by 68% by 2037 compared with today. In addition to demand, there are issues related to the supply of social care that also will shape reform. Social care is delivered through a mixed economy of care, with health and social care trusts being both providers of care directly and commissioners, commissioning it from both for-profit and not-for-profit providers. It is important to secure the best value for public funds, but there are questions about the sustainability of social care associated with the price being paid for it. Much of the social care workforce is a minimum wage workforce, and this has implications for the recruitment and retention of staff. It also contributes to the misconception that social care is a low-skill activity, um, which I have to emphasise in the most strong terms, it is not. If we are to respond to demand, um, we are going to have to take whatever steps are necessary to secure a sustainable supply of social care. A third driver for reform is the legitimate expectations that people using social care have of that care. Traditionally, social care was shaped by those who provided it. What providers thought people needed was what people got. An older generation who maybe had memories of a pre-Bevan and pre-Beveridge world tended to unquestioningly be grateful um, for whatever help they received. Increasingly, and I believe rightly, rather than simply accept what is on offer, many of those using social care want tailor-made support, and they want to do the tailoring. Although progress has been made in this area with the rise of self-directed support, more needs to be done to increase the flexibility and responsiveness of social care if we are going to meet people's expectations. Further reason for reform is the need to improve support for carers. Family and friends carers have always played a crucial role in supporting people with care needs, but as more and more people live longer and survive medical conditions and situations that perhaps they previously would not have done, um, the burden on carers has increased, as indeed has the age of carers. Um, the system 
quite simply could not function without the support provided by family and friend carers, and many feel the pressure on them is eroding their own health and social well-being uh, to a very significant degree. And then there is money. Uh, unlike social care, unlike health care, social care is not free to all at the point of delivery. Currently, it's not always understood that that's the case by those requiring care, and the arrangements for who pays and what they pay for are felt by some to be unfair. Furthermore, regardless of who pays, the costs of adult social care are likely to rise significantly, and so sustainability will be a challenge. Those are some of the main reasons, there are others, but those are the main reasons for needing to reform adult social care. In December 16, um, the then uh, Health Minister, um, uh, Michelle O'Neill, commissioned Des Kelly and John Kennedy to consider how these challenges might be responded to. And their report, Power to People, was published in December 17. The report contained 16 proposals for change. In the absence of a minister, the Permanent Secretary directed his officials, uh, including ourselves, to establish a process to analyse the report and develop options for an incoming minister to consider for implementation. In January 2018, a project board and project team began work, and over time they have been supplemented by an independent carers panel, a service users engagement group, and in addition we have had a series of workshops and focus groups held considering issues such as the role of the voluntary community sector and the needs of the workforce. Building on the work of Power to People, the project team have aligned the 16 proposals from Power to People into six major themes. Those are, firstly, staff who work in social care need to be valued, competent and resilient. Secondly, individuals using social care should have as much choice and control over the support that they receive as possible. Thirdly, prevention and early intervention should support people to achieve their own social well-being whenever and for as long as possible. Support for carers should be provided to carers in their own right and not be subject to the needs, the assessed needs of the person they're caring for. All services should support the primacy of home, including those services where home is a managed care environment. We need to recognise that while it may be staffed, it is still people's home and that should be uh, the primary consideration in how it's run and regulated. And finally, a social care system needs to be de de delivered through a stable and sustainable system. Although the work uh, on the reform of adult social care experienced significant delay as a result of staff being redeployed at a point in, <clears throat> at a point in time to support Brexit planning, we are now at an advanced stage, and the Minister hopes to bring forward an implementation plan in the coming months. That is my opening statement. We'll now try and answer your questions to the best of our abilities. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I'm wondering, and, and I know you made reference there to hospital discharge and the importance of, of hospital discharge, and I suppose it occurred to me at that point that um, <coughs> prevention of hospital admission is actually as, as significant, and perhaps maybe that more of the solutions lie there, and that support should be given to carers and to uh, people because we know that the outcomes, the health outcomes, are, are significantly impacted by hospital admission, and it also creates additional cost in the system. So I suppose that's as an observation. But in terms of question, will the department undertake to commission an independent through cost of care analysis as a basis for providing an informed basis to discuss the sustainability of adult social care? And it's important to note that the information should provide a range of options and not just a one model. A one model option. So what's the, what's the position now on cost of true cost of care? Certainly it was one of the recommendations of Power to People that we established the true cost of care. And initially we had planned going about that in a particular way, commissioning um, uh, an external institution to undertake a review. Unfortunately, at a point in time the funding that we had allocated for that became reallocated. That doesn't mean that we haven't been doing work to look at the true cost of care. We've been engaging with the independent uh, health care providers who represent care providers on this issue. We've also been doing some internal analysis and ongoing analysis of the market. We've also been looking to uh, work that's been done in other parts of uh, the UK that we feel can 
can inform our deliberations about the true cost of care. But I think there is still going to be a further piece of work that's going to be needed to be done that addresses the core issue of what a reasonable margin is um, for a provider to be sustainable um, and what that means for what we're going to have to pay for care on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that said, I think it is important to recognise that we have information available that would indicate that the market currently for nursing and residential home is relatively sustainable at the price being paid today. Domiciliary care, I would say, probably feels to me something which is under more pressure than uh, the nursing and home care sector. But I think those are things that we really need to have um, concrete information on rather than arguments from one side or the other or anecdotal evidence about. I'll look to my colleagues to see if they'd like to supplement that answer. We're obviously aware of some of the work that, for instance, the UK HCA have done to, to look at the costs and what they believe would be a, a fair rate of um, uh, uh, hourly fees for uh, domiciliary care. And we'll but we'll look at some of that work as we go forward, I'm sure, and consider what yeah. we uh, think the future should think, be here. And you've said, you've said, Sean, there, the, the importance, you've noted the importance of it, mm. so then I'm wondering why it was reallocated and not proceeded Well, with. I think it was at a point in time when the return of an administration was not foreseeable, um, and there were pressures, and this was one of the things that was felt we would push down the line. Um, but I, I think we recognise it does still need to be done. I think. What I would say, the information we do have in relation to what we pay for nursing and residential care, we tend to be about mid-level for what's paid across the UK, but domiciliary care, we're paying very much towards the bottom end of the scale, um, to the point that, I mean, you could say we're probably getting the most value out of any pound spent in health and social care for domiciliary care, but that's probably at the expense of sustainability. Yeah, and, and, and I do want to note. I think that's very worrying that that was that, that was pushed down because a lot of the, a lot of the, if we don't start to front load these solutions, we're going to keep doing the same things we're always done. And we have seen situations where learning disability budgets and several trusts are underspent, and it creates an impression that this is not seen as an, as, as the importance that it absolutely it should be central. Chair, I have no disagreement with that whatsoever. Um, I think that uh, for too many years, within the wider health and social care system, the prominence that social care required was not afforded it. Um, and too often, pressures in other parts of the system uh, were resolved by compromising um, uh, in the area of social care. I think that that has now gone. I don't think that that's, that's a, a prevalent um, mindset within the system, either at departmental, board or trust level. Okay. Um, one of the issues affecting social care is staffing and wages, and I do welcome, uh, personally, I welcome, I welcome the, the impact. Uh, we recognise that, that we have some of the best care staff and, and unpaid informal cures out there, and, and that those are actually uh, the foundation on which the entire system is largely based. But in relation to sleep-in staff receiving back pay, how does reform of social care address that issue, and does the social care compliance scheme apply here in the north? Uh, the thrust of the social care reform programme is not considering the specific issue of uh, sleep-in payments, which has been a dispute between staff and employees, uh, staff and employers um, throughout the UK. It's more about looking at how we can create a sustainable baseline for what people are paid and a career structure for them. In regard to the specific query, I don't have an immediate answer for you. Can you come back to us? We will do certainly. We'll yeah. Answer on that, sure. Okay, thank you. And, and the final one from me for now is um, in relation to, and there are obviously significant issues around coronavirus, but are there any specific plans or protocols in place to protect older people, especially care home residents, from coronavirus and an action plan to, are, are there specific action plans to contain the virus in those settings? Chair, you'll forgive me for um, uh, this response, but it's really, really important in the current situation that we have a unified process for responding to coronavirus and communicating both with elected representatives and the public. My colleague, Michael McBride, is leading that process, and I know you've had engagement with him on the issue. Social care is represented in the forums. Um, work is certainly underway, um, but I'd prefer not to respond to queries about the virus 
outside of those mechanisms. It's not that we won't respond, and we will, we'll, we'll absolutely, uh, and I mean, I can tell you, yes, we are making plans in relation to social <laughs> care, but just I think it's really important for public perception that there's a very consistent face um, and method for communicating in relation to coronavirus, and Michael's leading that, and I wouldn't want to, to muddy the waters. I, I apologise for that. I, I, it's not an unwillingness to answer the question. Yes, we are making plans. Social care is certainly integrated within those plans, and specifically the needs of people who are in nursing and care homes are being considered. But I'd rather channel responses. Well, well, that, uh, and, I, and, I, and I do accept that, and I do understand that, that, that communication is very important and, yeah. and has been... And has been um, working reasonably well, but I, I think that people are will be uh, will be will be keen to know that there is a plan being. And I am represented uh, in the regional gold planning arrangements. Okay, okay. Listen, I'm going to go to members there. So I have first of all Jerry, then Gemma, then Paula, then have a few others. But that's the order. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Sean, for Jerry. for the uh, report. It was obviously very detailed, and I went through it at all uh, yesterday, and there's stuff, a lot of stuff in it. Uh, just a couple of points for myself. I mean, I mentioned in the report about the need to be radical, and I would obviously generally agree with that. Um, but I think some of the proposals, whilst detailed, I think some of them don't go um, far enough and don't go uh, tick the box of being radical. I mean, I think first of all, I think um, there's nothing, from my understanding and recollection of the report, about moving towards publicly owned care homes, and that's a debate which is being kicked off. I think certainly in England, at least now, and um, possibly other places as well. Um, I think the figure is 900 million pounds spent on, on adult social care, and my understanding is, and I'm happy to be corrected, is over 70 per cent of that uh, is going through private organisations, be it the trusts. So payments to the trust and then going to private uh, companies. Um, and obviously in some of those, not all, but in some of those organisations, there's concerns that people are, are overworked, they're not adequately adequately trained, and they're not adequ adequately paid. There's there's problems with unions being allowed into some of them, uh, and you know, staff being forced to pay own own travel costs and, and issues like that. So I, th I think that's that's sort of one point uh, I'd like to hone in on. Is there has there been any conversations when the department were on the panel um, about the move towards publicly owned care homes? Because I think if there's if there's a concern over cost, and obviously if we need to spend one billion or two billion on adult social care, we need to spend that. But my concern would be that a lot of money is going to you know already well remunerated and financially um, well off organisations. And if there's concerns about some of those groups having um, maybe not best practice, put it, to put it like that, uh, I would be concerned. So I would just like to ask you the question, has there been any conversation about the move towards um, publicly owned yeah. car homes in particular? Okay. I mean, there are a lot of points raised in your question, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and address them uh, uh, as we go through the answer. The first thing to say is yes. There has been discussion about the balance. Um, uh, we have what's described as a mixed economy of care. That was established in policy going back to the 1990s. It was recognised that the um, ideal model was to have a, a, a mixture of providers which included provision from the statutory sector, uh, alongside provision from the private sector, and contributions from the voluntary and community sector. The mixed economy was established, but I don't think it was then managed. So uh, the, uh, there was never a clear um, policy position on what the proportion should be. And the proportions have ended up that about 30% of domiciliary care is now retained within the statutory sector, with 70% being, and this, these are rough proportions, out in the uh, private and independent sector. In the case of uh, nursing and uh, um, uh, care homes, the proportion is even greater towards um, the, the, the private sector. There were reasons why that happened. I mean, particularly in the um, home sector, one of the key things was as we introduced higher standards for reg regulatory standards for the physical environment of care homes, um, uh, we in the statutory sector had a lot of stock that was not of great quality. A lot of it had the classic problem of buildings from the 50s and 60s and 70s where there was asbestos present. Um, and we had a private sector who was saying, we have capital to invest. We will build homes to uh, these new very high standards. And they did. Um, uh, and that was one of the driving forces towards the expansion of the private sector, particularly in the, the home sector. Where we're at now, I think it is appropriate for us to ask the question whether the balance is right. Um, we've seen Issues arise with private providers uh, in relation to their business models on occasion, which we've managed and coped with, but certainly have made 
us wonder whether we've got the balance right. And I'm talking about uh, Southern Cross and um, latterly Four Seasons. These, uh, Southern Cross is a historical matter of record. Um, the difficulties that Four Seasons um, have had is in the public domain. Um, these are big companies who have um, uh, bases uh, overseas. Um, uh, and uh, given the centrality of having care home beds and nursing home beds to the operation of our system, a mix seems reasonable. But we have to consider is the exposure that we currently have to market forces appropriate. So we have been having some discussions about whether we need to redress the balance. Um, uh, we've had discussions recently about has the time come for trusts to uh, expand their direct provision in terms of homes. Um, those are ongoing discussions. Uh, there are financial questions as well. I mean, uh, certainly we've modelled if we were to take all of the domiciliary care provision back in house, what that would cost, and it is significant. Um, uh, whereas the balance we have there at the moment, I suppose, what it probably allows us to do is have um, the benefits of uh, independent providers um, in, in terms of their flexibility and, and innovation, while also allowing the statutory sector to concentrate its work on providing care where needs are more complex or in areas where it's not commercially viable. So areas where it's geographically hard to recruit carers, we find the statutory sector emphasising the work there. Now, where we'll arrive at is obviously going to be a decision for ministers, um, uh, 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 and it's a political decision. But your, your question was, is there some discussion about the mix? Yes, there is. I mean, I'm glad there's discussion. I think I would like to, I would like to see it advance a bit more, to be frank, <laughs> and to be coming in the policy and the behaviourisation. And obviously, you mentioned Bear Region and Bevan in your in your comments, and mm -hmm. that, that idea of the NHS being from the cradle to the grave. I think there's a concern that when you get you know closer to the grave or the you know, an el a position of illness, that it's essentially you're reliant and you're, you're forced out to the private sector. So that's a concern that uh, that, I, that I've been. Um, worried about, but I appreciate the, the answer and I would like to see it sort of sped up a, a bit more and ultimately become department uh, policy. Well, as I say, the discussion is ongoing and it is being fed into the, the <coughs> deliberations. Obviously, these are going to be political decisions in the final instance. Thank you. Um, Gemma? Thank you and thank you very much for your presentation. You mentioned domiciliary care there and about geographical problems. Um, as the committee is well aware now, I represent a very rural area of Romana and South Throne. And we have we're well aware of the yeah. problems of domiciliary care, so and how valuable it is to our to my constituents. Um, so on that, what plans are there for an adult safeguarding bill and carers' rights as part of these reforms legislation? Uh, there is active consideration on the, the 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 development of an adult safeguarding bill. You'll be aware of the Commissioner for Older People's report um, into Don Murray Manor and the specific recommendation that there be uh, the development of an adult safeguarding bill. Um, uh, we are uh, looking at that and, and developing um, options for consideration in relation to adult safeguarding. Uh, in relation to domiciliary care and uh, rural settings, um, I think we are recognising one of the phenomena of recent years has been, um, I suppose this goes back to Jerry's point to a certain extent, handbacks as they're called. Uh, we find in areas we're increasingly seeing companies who we have the money to pay for the care that, at the price they've agreed. Um, we have people needing the care, but they're handing those packages back saying they can't find the people um, to deliver the care. And I think that's central to the need for reform, and that's yeah. why one of the major streams of work that we're developing is on the workforce. So that um, not just in rural areas, mm -hmm. everywhere, but it's particularly relevant to, to, to rural areas, that we can have a system where um, people who are involved in social care can see it not as... Um, a, a stopgap till they get something else or not as well I might get a job in retail I might get a job in hospitality I might get a job in social care but more no I actually want a career in social care uh, and so that's why there's a, a workforce stream. Um, Mark do you want to add anything on the adult safeguarding piece? Um, no I think that covers it were you going to pick up on care? did you ask about carers? Carers rights. Yeah. Carers rights um, yeah, there is a uh, um, certainly carers were, were referenced in Power to People um, and there has been a work stream uh, in relation to looking at the needs of carers uh, and carers have been represented on the project board. So we've been hearing the voice of carers very strongly. Currently the only right a carer has in legislation is to an assessment. Um, and uh, at the time, I think that was seen as a, a significant step forward. However, being assessed and being told you need something and then having those needs met, really, I don't think 
takes you very far. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're certainly looking at how that might be developed. Um, uh, and um, uh, as I said, with um, John and Des, they were very, very clear that they felt that carers needed to be identified as people having needs completely independent of the person who they're caring for and the ability to provide support for them. <laughs> so that is under active consideration in the work that we're undertaking. I can have to say also in terms of the workforce, in terms of the rural areas, actually that workforce is also an economic value to that area. It's where people get jobs, it's mm -hmm. that they get jobs in the locality. This is for the most part a part-time workforce, um, mostly females caring for, with, their, with their children at the same time as they are, are, are working and supporting local people in their area. So I mean it's equally as important for the economic value uh, of that, of that area as much as for the um, for the care that they provide as well. Yeah, so can I actually just em emphasise that point because it's one of the most frustrating dynamics of the debate about social care is that people often frame it as a burden. Mm -hmm. And money spent on social care is not relieving a burden. It, 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 it's, it's, it's supporting people, but it's also a sector of the economy. It provides employment. Um, and there's good reason to believe that it may become an increasingly significant sector of employment. Um, there are a lot of areas where um, jobs may go to artificial, artificial intelligence and automation in the coming years. The reality of care is those, those developments will have a bearing on care. But we know the thing that people value most from social care is a relationship with another person. It's going to be a long time before that's replaced by a robot. Um, and I think that we need to recognise the value of social care, not just in terms of, uh, you know, sort of how it helps our healthcare system or how it supports individuals, but it's going to be a really important part of the economy. And just one more question. Um, one thing that might actually help with recruitment is becoming a living wage employer. Um, proposal 6 suggests this, so have we any update on that or where are we... Obviously, we are um, developing um, options for our political masters to consider, yeah. and their considerations are going to be contingent on financial settlements. But if you're asking me, are we modelling different options for how we make the workforce more sustainable, um, and that would have to include looking at remuneration, yes, we are. Just, just as a follow-up to Gemma's question there, Sean, and you have, you have mentioned about you know, it's going to be part of the adult social care reform, but the crisis in domiciliary care is, is here on top of us now at the present time. So what's happening at the minute to try to address it? Because in some ways it can't wait. You're already seeing situations where people are either still in hospital where they don't need to be or as a result of, of a domiciliary care not being available. So what's happening right now to try to meet that demand? I think... I would urge a little bit of caution about the narrative that um, it's a major cause of discharge delay. I hear that frequently, um, and there is work that is analysing the difficulties in discharge, and sometimes the absence of a care package is a factor in delaying someone from being discharged. Frequently, however, I've been told that it's a factor, but when you analyse it, it's not maybe the crucial issue that people have said it was. Um, we have to improve processes within hospitals to make sure that from the moment someone admitted, active planning for their discharge is commenced. Um, if it isn't commenced at the point of admission, there will be a delay. But I think it would be wrong to characterise that as a, a delay that's originating in a problem in social care. But yes, there is work. We have a regional discharge group, which uh, is uh, led by uh, the board and the public health agency, which is analysing the issue of delays in discharge, including um, how we can uh, make sure that the appropriate social care is available at the point of discharge. We're also doing things that address the big themes that I've talked about. Um, uh, we're not waiting for, for the finalisation of the policy. So, for example, trying to make um, social care and domiciliary care more attractive to young people as um, uh, 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 an area to enter for employment. The Northern Ireland Social Care Council has been doing some fantastic work in that area um, and has been... Uh, reaching out to young people in schools and colleges, has been working with further education colleges in terms of uh, what um, vocational training and courses can be available. So there is work in place um, uh, or ongoing to address the challenge in, in social care. But I do think there are some big shifts that are needed, um, and those will require the, the, the delivery of this policy. Yeah, and, and I do agree, by the way, that hospital discharge is not the only issue because I knew, you would. Having, I knew you would. We're also it. having hospital admissions as a result of trips and slips and things like that, yeah. and we have people deteriorating potentially because of the care. So there are other other yeah. concerns around that. So, okay, um, going now to Paula. 
Thank you, um, Chair, uh, and thank you for your presentation. I just want to, to raise two separate issues. Um, the first one relates to care workers in my constituency of South Belfast. It's probably more of a Belfast urban issue as opposed to AGM is in the rural. And I, I, I have tried to raise this in several, ven or several ways, but haven't got anywhere with it. Some of the care workers, um, who, especially in the independent sector, are really struggling to get their way around South Belfast because of the congestion in the morning. And as you know, some conditions like Parkinson's, your medicines are very timely in getting that. And I wrote to the department, I wrote to the health trust to see if they could use bus lanes. And we got nowhere. The, the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust said that they allocated a certain number, and, but they never got to the independent sector. So that is a, a huge frustration. You know, if you turn up, you're, you're late for your appointment. And then added on to that, then, we have got a new um, residents-only parking scheme in the Holy Lands area. Um, so again, care workers are driving around for ages, can't get parked. I got a letter from the Department for Infrastructure yesterday said that they've now completed the analysis of that and they're going to start rolling that out. <coughs> so it's going to be a bigger problem in South Belfast. You just cannot get so you, you can't get there in, in time and when you get there you can't get parked. So, so these are just issues of, of just really trying to make their, their daily um, commute easier between jobs. So I would like you you don't necessarily need to comment on that, but please take that on board because I'm getting nowhere anywhere else with it. If you'll forgive me, I will comment yes. uh, uh, in how it relates to, I mean, the very specific issues of bus lanes and <coughs> um, residence parking, I don't have an immediate answer for okay. you, but I will follow up with please. you uh, on that. I do think, though, there is a general issue about care workers travelling um, from one uh, client to another, um, and uh, in particular, the practice that has happened in some instances where care workers have not been paid for travel, either their time like or their costs for getting from one, one case to another. I just don't think that that's sustainable. One of the things that uh, Des and John looked at in their report, and it's one of the things that we're exploring, is how care can become more neighbourhood-based. Um, one of the, 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 the uh, situations we have is people do drive quite some distances from one case to another case. Um, and one of the things that Des and John were interested in, said we should explore and we are exploring, is the possibility for more community owned and very local providers of care so that the travel that they need to undertake is not as significant. Now, that doesn't address the it issues in somewhere like South Belfast. I understand that. <laughs> but I do think that, you know, sort of the the, if you had um, care providers who were dealing with um, much more concentrated, concentrated geographic areas, um, a desirable situation because I mean we, we have de population density that probably would allow this for care workers to actually walk from one client mm -hmm. to the other because they would be much closer together. Yeah. Um, Jackie, was there anything else you want to say? No, I'm just actually going to make yeah. that point and say that you know we are, we are as you know the Health and Social Care Board have developed a new model for domiciliary care, which is based on that locality model, mm -hmm. and it's currently being. Um, uh, test it within um, some of the trust areas, uh, specifically the southeastern trust area. Um, and we're hearing good reports. It's, it's early days, mm -hmm. but we're hearing good reports about that. So certainly we're, we're hoping to move towards that kind of neighbourhood. But we approach. will specifically follow up on Thank the you. bus lane and uh, the uh, parking passes issue and come back to you directly. Um, so my second question, I met with the British Association of Social Workers yesterday and I was pleased to hear that they are some of the representatives are feeding into the new Encompass programme around how the records can be more streamlined, as you know, a lot of their time is spent with bureaucracy. And I'm just wondering about how care workers will, will be able to feed into that, because I'm conscious, as you said there, that they are the ones that have the personal relationships and they can see from day to day a deterioration or a change in somebody's behaviour or jaundice or, or whatever. And I'm just wondering how, um, if they're going to have a role in terms of feeding information into that and whether they're their jobs can be made easier through technology or, or this, this programme? I think there are probably three different um, angles to technology and social care uh, that are sort of are closest to your question. Um, one of the uh, things that I think that technology can bring is more innovative and responsive booking systems. Um, and a number of providers have invested in good software for this, which makes sure that when they're considering how many slots have to be covered, um, that they're not doing it with pen and paper and um, scribbling out names on a rotor and what have you, that they're using software that can add a degree of efficiency. That's certainly something that a lot of providers um, are currently doing and we're encouraging and looking at ways that we can encourage more to make sure that they're appropriately using information technology to enhance their, their management overall. The 
second is that care workers are workers on the move. And so um, with simple handheld devices, you can increase their effectiveness yeah. so that um, if people can record the fact that they've done a visit, um, uh, maybe communicate information about that visit remotely, that mm -hmm. delivers an efficiency. Uh, and that also is one of the things we're, we're discussing with the Encompass team. The third thing, though, is how um, technology can actually enhance or support the delivery of care. Um, I'm not contradicting my own earlier point about a human relationship being the most important thing, but I do think that over the next um, number of years we'll see developments about technology blending into how you deliver care. Um, uh, one of the things, I mean, it's often assumed that older people aren't very savvy with, um, uh, with, with, with tech. Uh, grandchildren change that quite rapidly, and particularly the desire of grandparents to stay in touch with grandchildren. So I'm sure in your family, as in mine, that you, you'll have the phenomena of grandparents who are Skyping their grandchildren and having that kind of interaction. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at is because isolation and loneliness <coughs> can be as big an issue as actually needing physical care support, is whether or not there are remote um, solutions to helping people stay more in touch using technology that's already available. So that's one of the things that we're, we're looking at. And then there's also going to be technology in the direct provision of care. Um, I think that's a bit further away. Um, we've had some false dawns, but there will be advances in both um, artificial intelligence and robotics. I think they will support and enhance rather than take over mm -hmm. the delivery of social care. But technology will play a role there. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And I think, as I have noted previously, it will be vital that all areas have access to broadband to support that type of, so that we don't open up an inequality, a further inequality around access to technology and to care. And I think that's very much a health issue in that respect. I think that point and Paula's point actually just emphasise the need for joined up planning in relation to social care. One department isn't going to um, be able to have all of the answers. Thank you. Um, Oh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, really, in relation to um, measuring the extent of unmet need and issues around data collection, um, etc. Um, so, could you tell us uh, what mechanisms the department uses to establish current and future levels of social care need at regional and local levels? And the second question would be to ask you what information the department collects to establish the levels of unmet need at regional and local levels. We've been doing an awful lot of work um, through this process for planning purposes about projecting what we think the future needs are going to be. And we use uh, a variety of sources of data. We use um, the data, certainly, that the trusts themselves hold about the delivery of care that they are currently doing. And we extrapolate that uh, alongside other data. Probably demographic data is the most significant um, uh, additional source that we look at. We've been using a, um, uh, a methodology uh, called um, systems dynamic modelling um, as one of the ways of trying to identify what the future is going to look like. Um, and it's, um, I have to say, from the absolute outset, I do not understand this. <laughs> this, is, this is something that there, there actually is not widespread um, capability in, but we do have access to some of the skills in this area. But it's about taking lots of different data sources, uh, modeling them, and then working out if you vary um, a, a, a value in one of the data sets, what implications that has on other things. So if, for example, uh, you were to change the rate that you pay care workers, what might that do to other things related to the supply of care workers, the churning care workers, um, or whatever? Or early intervention. If you start investing in early intervention, what might the impact on that have in relation to hospital admissions? So we are doing some of that work. This is not an exact science. It is uh, about predicting the future. But we're drawing on a, a, a very wide range of data sources, say, ranging from our own internal performance data from, uh, through to external sources like um, uh, demographic um, uh, information. In terms of unmet need, I suppose currently the way we probably assess on that need um, uh, uh, it relates to uh, waiting times for care packages, you know, sort of how quickly you can um, meet a need that's been expressed to you. That's valuable information, but I do think that it's distorted slightly by what we've done in relation to thresholds. Um, over the past number of years, and this is a phenomena across 
lots of public sector services or a, a, um, a publicly funded services. When you're faced with rising demand and constrained supply of a service to meet that demand, what you do is you introduce a threshold of eligibility before someone can access that service. And it is, I think, uh, um, incontrovertible to say that over the past decade, we have raised the threshold. So the level of need you need to be able to need to have before you can get a service now is higher than it was previously. That's happened across the UK. It also happens in healthcare in some instances as well. Now, the difficulty then with using waiting times for uh, assessing unmet need is you're assessing unmet need at that high threshold that you've established, um, and you're not capturing other kinds of needs that don't meet that threshold, but which could eventually have an impact on your longer-term demand for services. So that's the early intervention piece. If you're not providing an early intervention service, you don't assess the absence of one as being unmet need. But the reality is that if you started providing one, you might impact on the need that is above that threshold. Sorry if that's a bit convoluted, but um, I mean, that, that's one of the things that we're exploring, is have we gone too far in shoehorning need into a high threshold? Mark, do you want to add anything to that? No, just obviously there is that. Some people waiting for care packages, but you will always have some degree of churn as people are kind of waiting and brought onto care packages. So kind of understanding how much is kind of natural churn and how much is um, uh, the lack of capacity in the system, again, relates to Yeah, that. we so don't sure. have a massive problem with waiting times generally for care packages where we tend to have problems are where people have very particular needs so either because of where they live or the complexity of their care needs sometimes that can result in an extended delay in uh, meeting the supply but broadly speaking we have reasonable flow in terms of people being assessed and needing care and them receiving that care yeah, I do appreciate that and um Obviously, many of us are involved in the um, APG for uh, ageing older people, and we've been looking at this issue. And it would be good to know going forward is the back to technology and is the Encompass um, program or project is it, will it help in terms of data collection? Because there, there are always issues. You know, every time we go out and ask <coughs> questions to of the different trusts, you get different responses and different. Yeah, no, you know, all different systems of collecting data, and it's very difficult for us to even to scrutinise and understand what's no. going on when the trust don't seem to... I'd fully agree with you. I think there are two problems there. One is, as you've said, that we have a number of different trusts, and they have different variations on how they collect data, and that's a problem. We're continuously trying to make sure that that is standardised. But the other difficulty is data in real time. Currently, an awful lot of the information we have on, say, domiciliary care comes from an annual survey that we do. So we survey on a given date, once a year, and we collect the information. That's valuable, and it does give us an awful lot of information, but it's not the same as real-time data. Now, we don't have the ability currently to collect real-time data. Um, I think that that would be a big advance um, that hopefully Encompass will support. I think that the, the challenge will have certain Encompass will, across the board, really improve the, the consistency and the availability of data. Obviously, within um, social care, we've got that interface with, interface with private companies that are delivering care. Mm. So um, there is functionality within uh, the, the provider system, which, which will be um, uh, supporting the Encompass program. I think we need to have um, further conversations around how that functionality is used and to what extent we can either interface with or provide functionality to uh, private providers and their systems. Um, and those, those conversations are kind of ongoing and to happen and it's obviously part of making sure the Encompass program is successful is taking the judgments on kind of which bits we start immediately um, and then which bits we seek to exploit at later points and there's, there's discussions going on around that what the immediate functionality is and what we seek to develop at later points. Can I just also say, I mean, I think the point about data is really, really important. Um, and in, in addition to Encompass, when we gather an awful lot of data, but we don't always know just how effective that data is in terms of helping us plan for the future. Some of it is extremely. The, the Health and Social Care Board are doing a piece of work at the moment, looking at that data and thinking about, well, how do we actually move to a much more outcomes-focused approach to that data? I think that will encourage us to streamline what we need and what, and what is useful to us. Um, and also, uh, in terms of our early discussions with the Encompass team, we are quite clear that rather than just put everything onto the system, 
we need at this stage to start to be quite uh, selective about what is, is going to actually help us in the future and, um, and what actually data do we no longer need because sometimes, as you know, we, we start suffering and it just carries on without actually a real purpose for it. So we're, Sorry, we're going to look at that. If I can just follow on from that, and a really important point is about the move to outcomes data, because currently an awful lot of the debate about adult social care is framed in terms of beds or time. You know, how many uh, minutes or hours uh, do you get in a domiciliary care package, or is a bed available for someone in a nursing home? And really, that doesn't tell us about what I said the purpose of social care is, how we're supporting someone's social well-being. Um, we buy beds and we buy minutes. Um, I think we'd be very interested in looking to a situation where we buy outcomes, where we buy improvements in people's social well-being for a defined population. It's not straightforward. We've been looking around for um, uh, others who have led the way in this field, and uh, after a full starts, we find they haven't got as far as maybe we thought they had got, but it's still something that we want to pursue, that we get away from a simple transactional, we're buying you 20 minutes or half an hour, or we're buying you a bed, to saying, well, we're buying you the independence to be able to continue to go to your local leisure centre, go to the pub, or, or, or whatever. We need to start to shift towards outcomes. But that, that is a challenge. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that, that speaks to an earlier point raised in terms of creating business models around all of this where it's, it's care and you know that that's really what should be at the centre. So we'll have Alex, Arlea, Sinead and then Alan in that order. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. One of the proposals in the part of people is concerning with the grain I concorded with the public, which ensure that citizens are well informed about their indictments and rights as well as their responsibilities and duties. What steps has the Department taken to develop a concordat to stimulate debate and agreement with the public about the future adult care and support system? Okay. Um, I mentioned in my opening remarks that um, there are some fundamental differences between social care and health care, and the most significant one is the fact that one is a universal service free at the point of delivery, and the other is paid for and subject to means testing. Um, that's not widely understood. I think there's research that suggests that at the point when people need social care, something like 66% of people uh, aren't aware of the fact that they're going to be means tested and assessed, uh, assessed for paying for it. Um, I think that one of the things that often causes the greatest resentment isn't the fact of charging, but it's the fact that people hadn't understood that they would be charged. So Dares and John felt that we have to be much more explicit about what the offer is, what support is available, and it shouldn't come as a surprise to people. Um, and so they were very keen that there would be, and they described it as a concordat, that there would be a public clear statement about what the state's duties were, um, what you could expect um, uh, to be provided for you, what you might have to pay for. Um, certainly we are doing work um, looking at how a concordat would work, but we're doing other work that's also in the same space, which is trying to raise understanding of the issue of social care and trying to make sure that people have a greater appreciation of what it is and what the offer is. Jackie, you've been involved in doing something yes, about that. Yeah. I think as a starting point, even if you look at our project board, we've got a very wide range of stakeholders who have been in, uh, involved in informing the work of the reform team. That in itself is a discussion that has started around how do we take social care forward, how do we reform it, what needs to be done. Um, it will inform decisions that we will have to think about in the future. What is the role of the state in providing social care? What is it the and what is it the responsibility of the individual? Um, so we are having those discussions. We've had discussions also within the department around how we might do that in more creative ways. So how do we get young people, for instance, at school, and you know, um, as a, to start thinking about? Well, I'm leaving school now, and you know, someday I might need social care. We all think of it in terms of older people, but we. Things can happen to us in life, and sometimes we might need social care at an earlier stage. So, how do I? How, what's my responsibility in thinking about that? And as a family, how do we pay for that? Or, or, or is that going to be the responsibility totally of the state? I mean, those are discussions and debates that we have to have. But uh, so we are certainly looking at those issues, and we will have um, uh, options that we will put before the minister. Okay, thank you. And um, when does the department plan to evaluate the impact of its reform agenda? How does it plan to involve people who can use the services and their carers in the evaluation process? And how frequently will evaluations take place? Okay, all policy um, should be subject to an evaluation of its impact and um, what policies come forward through 
uh, Pirates people will um, certainly be subject to that. Uh, we'll look at what we consider to be the appropriate timeline because it might be different for different aspects of the policy. So, for example, if um, we were to look at some measures that might be taken to create a sustainable workforce, they might be amenable to be evaluated fairly quickly um, because you could see changes in the uh, employment market relatively quickly. Whereas if we're bringing forward early intervention and prevent preventative measures, the evaluation for their impact may be something that has to go on over several years. Um, so the answer is it'll be different for different aspects of the policy, but it will be subject to um, uh, evaluation. With regard to the involvement of um, people in that evaluation, I'd say we mean to go on as uh, carry on as we've started. Um, we currently have significant involvement in the development of this policy of people who both use services and people who are uh, carers. Um, indeed, uh, one of the work streams looking at the needs of carers, the um, draft paper that we're working from has more or less been written by carers, um, and we would intend to continue in that vein. I think that there's a, a phrase that's become very common uh, in uh, uh, healthcare circles recently. It's actually been around in social care for a lot longer, and it's co-production. We recognise very much that for the services to be the right fit for people, they have to be designed by the people who are going to use them. So that will extend to the evaluation. Thank you. Okay, um, Orlika. Thanks, Chair, um, and thank you to the panel for um, all your contributions, Sean. At the end of your um, briefing, I know you finished off saying that hopefully in a number of months the Minister will be bringing forward the implementation plan. But um, just in the briefing note that we were provided with, um, there was mention around that the development of the action plan was delayed in 2018. Um, and I would maybe be concerned just around some lost opportunity um, to develop some of the proposals and the work streams. Um, even throughout the past three years, of, we haven't had a minister in place. But I'm just conscious at the minute, and um, before we heard your briefing, there still is no report or proposals with the minister at uh, present. So um, my question would be similar to Colm's point earlier on: um, Why did reform of adult social care slip down the <coughs> list of priorities? If there is one reason, a, a number of reasons. Um, so that would be my first question, maybe to Sean. The second one um, to Mark, maybe. Um, just in the briefing paper again, it was talking about the move from the mental health directorate then into the um, into the office of social services. And was any of this um, down to whenever there was maybe some changes around planning for Brexit? Would, was the mental health um, was the mental health group maybe disproportionately impacted by that, as opposed to other sections within the, the health department? Thank you. Okay. I, I, I mean, absolutely, Brexit was central to the delay. Okay. Um, uh, uh, originally, this work was being taken forward by the person who held Mark's post prior to him. Um, uh, I mean, Mark's responsibilities extend. They do include mental health, but they also include older people, learning disability, and physical disability. Yeah. So it's a broad portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, within a very short period of time, the person doing Mark's job and nearly all of the team who were working on this were taken to do no-deal Brexit planning work. So Brexit was central to the delay. Now, um, we let that act as a halt for a period, um, but after a while, we just felt it wasn't acceptable for it to continue to be um, delayed. So I turned to Jackie, um, who, with at that stage no additional resource, mm -hmm. took on the work of developing this policy. Um, now, with no additional resource, it obviously wasn't moving at the pace that it had previously. Um, uh, we're now moving at a good pace. What I would say in terms of, I've used the phrase in a few months. Um, I've tried using the phrase with the minister before summer. All I'll say is the minister is very, very anxious and was talking to uh, the three of us a couple of days ago and expressed in no sh sort of short order his expectation that the proposal would be with him very quickly. And uh, have you got, yeah, I'm moving then to uh, Sinead. Thank you. Um, just uh, actually just follow on on that because I think it is a, a very good point because there is so much in the document and I would like to get into detail but I think in terms of knowing that it's actually creating pace and moving is critical at this time. So you're aiming to present an implementation plan 
And I would just like to understand better then what will be in that implementation plan in terms of proposals, costings, and your anticipated then movement to see implementation where this will actually be on the ground affecting real people who are dependent on it. Okay. Um, we obviously need to uh, take forward proposals to a minister who will then decide what goes into a final plan. Uh, the nature of the areas that we're considering will obviously require public consultation, um, so there'll be a consultation period. In terms of implementation, it'll vary. Some things I would see will be able to go into practice really quickly. Um, uh, there, there, there are some things you can start doing virtually straight away. Some will be conditional on what financial resource is available, and we don't know what the settlement is yet. And some, by their definition, will take time. Uh, an earlier reference was made to uh, an adult safeguarding bill. If legislation is one of the things that flows from this, there's obviously pressure uh, on the legislative timetable, and it will have to take its place in that. So I, I, it's not a very satisfactory answer. What I would say is some things will be immediate, some things will take a bit longer, and some things will be defined by the nature uh, of a, a, a legislative process. I suppose the earliest delivery, because I know there are things in there about um, supported living and shared housing, and, and I know they're probably longer reach, but the earlier reach, at what point would you start to see? Well, some things we've started anyway, because some things we don't feel we needed to wait for a minister. So um, uh, and that's not a disrespect to, to a minister. It's just that, I mean, there are things that you could do. So Jackie mentioned earlier that we've been testing some models. We've started that because we felt, well, a minister will want to decide whether you roll out a model. He'll want to see the evaluation. We, we, we didn't feel we needed a minister to actually develop and test a new model. So that's been the case with domiciliary care. So um, uh, in the South Eastern Trust, people have been starting to experience a different way of receiving domiciliary care, um, uh, and we haven't waited. But whether that were to become a model that we'd want to roll out more widely, that would be subject to a minister's consideration of the evaluation. Yeah. I, yes, I just want to make the same point. It's that we, we you know, transformation is not just it's not just waiting for the reform work. So if we think about the workforce, um, Sean, uh, uh, as already said, um, the non-social care accounts has done significant work in trying and promoting social care as a, as a really valuable uh, career. Um, they are doing lots of work around that space. We um, we've been, we're looking at ways in which we can promote the value of the work. Course, um, in a range of different ways, things like career pathways, etc. So that work has commenced. So we're, we're not waiting um, necessarily just for this final um, paper to be done. Where we can start work, and it's been able to do so, we have done. We've done that. And, and just to pick up on one point from that, um, I mean, I know that everyone wants to see change, and they can see deficits, and they see where things need to be improved. But it is worth reflecting that the the the, the this. The Assembly, in its previous incarnation, passed legislation which was at the, the leading edge of legislation in the UK to actually register social care workers before anyone else in the UK had done so. Um, Northern Ireland led the way, and we now see Scotland and Wales following suit. Um, so I just think it's important to realise that you know, there has been progress in this area and leading progress in the past. And, Chair, I'd just like to add, um, I, I really welcome the the content in the document and the spread of contributors because it it isn't you know there's very rich information in there from the voluntary and uh, community sector people like AGNI but also that broader spectrum looking at perhaps younger people who have um, deteriorating illnesses and you know so it, it does speak to the the wide breadth of social care but through my work in the constituency office, I have found that there is a continual confusion on pathways from sometimes healthcare to social care, and people don't know at what point they've left healthcare and go in to social care, and equally from healthcare or social care to palliative care. Um, and, and there can be a real breakdown in communication. And I, I just want to know um, what efforts will be made to make sure there's equality and clear communication to people in this um, dependent on these services. I think there are probably two elements to that, and one is the point going uh, back earlier to um, Alex's point in relation to a concordat. There is a need for us to be much more explicit and transparent um, uh, uh, about what 
is available and what you can expect. But then there are also decisions to be made about, you know, sort of where, because the line between healthcare and social care gets blurred in places. I mean, you've mentioned palliative care, and that's a point in case I think that you know, sort of, when you, you, your needs are social care and when your needs are palliative care, like it, it doesn't. It's not today it was one and tomorrow it's another. But we do have different funding arrangements for them, um, and, and I think there needs to be some more work done on that to make that. I mean, whatever the decision is, just that people know what it is. I think is the important thing. Um, so I take that point very much on board. And Chair, could I just raise one point on that? Because I know there has been, as far as I'm aware, and I'm trying to get to more detail on it, um, the importance of things such as a continu continuing assessment of need. And if that's in place or not in place, it may result in whether a person has to fund or not fund their future care. And that doesn't appear to be consistent across trusts. And I would just be eager to know that this system wouldn't repeat errors that may exist? We will certainly um, hope uh, that that would be the case. If you have a, a specific issue you, you want us to, to, to look into, we'll, we, we can also respond to that. that. In relation to the lanes being blurred, Sean, I have to say that um, in terms of my own experience and what, what I hear now as, as an MLA is that the lanes actually are quite clear in that most of the trusts are providing social care at the level of critical f at four, level four, which is critical need which is where a person would either significantly deteriorate in terms of health or be admitted to hospital. So we're actually, at, we're actually stripped back down to the health, very clearly healthcare needs, and that has to be demonstrated by an allied health professional, an OT or a physio or something like that. So I think there, there's, there may have been blurred lines in the past, but I think we're down at the point we're working from now, it's actually, this is, this is a essential, essential critical care. I think absolutely you, you, you're, you're right about that, and that goes back to the point earlier about thresholding. I think there are some areas where there is a degree of confusion as to whether or not it's a healthcare need or a social care need. Um, uh, and I mean, you'll be aware of this. This often arises in the case of uh, support for people with dementia. Um, uh, and uh, people sometimes have an expectation um, that because their social care need is driven by an illness, that it maybe is healthcare or is it social care? And that is an issue of ongoing. Um, consternation for a lot of people. Thank you. And finally, Alan. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, <clears throat> can I just say, uh, at the outset, that over the years, uh, having visited friends and family in nursing care and residential care, I've always found that the staff and the management are, are very well intended and, and very dedicated, and they certainly they go the extra mile in, in what is a particularly stressful environment. Uh, to provide excellent care to those in their care. Um, but in terms of, uh, we've heard there that 30% of the, the uh, residential care is statutory and 70% is in the private sector. And it worries me uh, that possibly, I mean, th we'll have to be realistic, the private sector exists uh, to make money, to make profit, and that's, that's just the reality, to make big investments. And new properties and, and furnishing and everything else. So, uh, the, yes, they have a right to make profit. Um, but it worries me that uh, there is a potential. I mean, I've seen a situation in, in nursing homes where um, residents who need assistance go to the bathroom. They might need one care worker to go with them, they might need two. I've been told they may have to wait 15 minutes before they, they can be taken to the bathroom, and that's not satisfactory situation, but it is, unfortunately, the reality uh, in a lot of the homes, if not all the homes. Um, and I just wonder, is that uh, in the pursuit of profit, uh, if um, the care and staff availability and, and quality of meals, etc., uh, can be compromised uh, in the pursuit of the, the owners trying to enhance their, their profit? And I know that you can have an inspection of a home, and everything may on the surface look fine, uh, but there, there can be uh, subtle tweaks been made uh, in the care package to, to enhance the profit margin. So do you have any sort of accountancy systems in place um, to ensure uh, that private homeowner isn't really um, 
really going daft on, on, the, on the profit that they're making uh, at the expense of the care that they, that they offer? Um, I think it's in, well, the first thing is the 70 30 split specifically related to domiciliary care. It's actually even greater in terms of the private sector when it comes to uh, nursing and residential homes. Um, the uh, statutory provision of that kind of residential accommodation is now very, very small. Um, uh, and that, I suppose, goes back to the earlier debate about whether or not that should be expanded. In terms of the care provided, the standards that are applied. Um, the regulatory standards are the same, um, regardless of the, prov the, the, the provider. So um, uh, the, the, the minimum standards that are required should not differ um, in a private home uh, versus a, uh, a, a statutory home. And I'd have to say, from the, and this is from personal experience with relatives who've um, uh, been in both um, uh, what was a statutory home, the old St John's home in uh, Downpatrick, and uh, um, other relatives who've been in private care homes. I've not seen a straightforward... It, 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 I couldn't say statutory good, private bad. I mean, it, it, it isn't like that. I mean, um, I think that the staff who deliver care, uh, be they working in, in statutory homes or, or, or private homes, does, isn't the thing that determines whether they're good staff or whether the care is good. And interestingly, the research would indicate that that's the case. The, the key thing seems to be not whether it's a statutory home or a private home, but the quality of the leadership in the home. Um, there, there's a growing body of leadership which seems to suggest that the quality of care really turns on the home manager. Um, and that can work both ways. The um, uh, appointment of a strong leadership team can very quickly lead to an improvement in the quality of care, and the moving on of that team can very quickly see a deterioration in the quality of the care. And that's one of the things that we're increasingly talking to our regulatory colleagues in the RQIA about, about how we can have more advanced knowledge and intelligence and understanding about what's happening in a care home, so that we can prevent situations where care has gone from being acceptable to not acceptable and it not being picked up upon. And leadership seems to be uh, a, a key feature. The broader point about um, profits, no, there isn't a, uh, a regulatory mechanism to limit profit uh, in the care home sector. Um, we've talked about this, and I mean, it, it, it's, uh, I suppose I, I, I think that it's possible to look on social care almost like a, a, a national utility. It's like, like water, like electricity, um, like some other things. It's just essential to the running of the country. Um, and in those other sectors, we do see regulation specify margins. So in the electricity sector, in the water sector, there are specified margins of profit. We don't have that in the care sector. I'm not sure it would be feasible to introduce such a system, but it, has some, it is something that we, we, we've discussed. Now, certainly if you were having a presentation from the independent healthcare providers, they would tell you there is no excessive profiteering in their sector, and they would be arguing the opposite case. Um, I, I, I would say that I don't see there being evidence that there's excessive profit being made. Um, there are people who um, are leaving the marketplace because they're saying the returns are not sufficient for them. Now, uh, we're not seeing um, huge gaps in provision uh, as a result of that. Other providers seem to be willing to take on provision at the moment, but I don't think at the moment that there, that, that there is uh, excessive profit take, being taken out of the, 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 the care home system. And as I say, the key thing in terms of quality of care seems to relate to leadership rather than it being private or statutory. But in, in terms of, I mean, I appreciate that about leadership, but uh, I mean, a, a leader in a home with the best will in the world, if, if, if they have uh, their seniors coming in and uh, showing them the balance sheet and saying, you know, uh, we'll have to make more profit. You're not making enough profit. There's a here. regulatory flaw so, to that, though. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's worth saying. Obviously, the uh, the trusts are obviously responsible for ensuring that the <coughs> excuse me the quality of the care that they have commissioned is sufficient. And then the RQIA have a, a regulatory function. And I was um, with them on a visit to a care home a couple of weeks ago. They will look at the care plans. They will see that you know Mr. Smith or whoever should be checked on every 50 minutes. Talk to the staff to make sure that that, that is being done. Uh, speak to residents, uh, families, and friends separately to to see what the feeling is around the care now. Now, now no system is absolutely perfect, and there's uh, a review going on at the minute in the department around the 
uh, regulation uh, and how well that, that works and how we can continue to improve that. But as Sean says, we're, there is a, a system of regulation and a system of care management in place there to ensure that we get the quality of care uh, that we need to receive and that there, there can't be someone reducing the quality of care that needs to be delivered in order to, to take um, excess profits. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for all the presentations and the answers. I think I think we're very acutely aware in terms of the uh, that this is this is one of the key things that we need to address if we're going to create real transformation. I think the adult social care elements of it. I'm glad we have we have touched upon the community and voluntary sector and the contribution that they make, and also, and I think fundamentally, the, the massive contribution of carers. And I know at the outset, Sean, you recognise that, and that carers are getting significantly older and complex health difficulties themselves, mental health issues are a problem, and I think we really need to get uh, better support and more tailored support in earlier for carers and better co-production with the community and voluntary sector, people who are using services. And I think the other thing is that and I think a lot of us in the committee would share the same view around the importance of having a properly valued domiciliary care workforce and that they're valued in terms of their pay, in terms of their conditions, and also in terms of career progression, which, which could assist with some of the other difficulties in, in terms of workforce. So I think this is in common with a lot of the areas we've dealt with. It's one we will be coming back to as a committee. We're dealing with a lot of inquiries around Dunmurray and Muckamore, and there are other issues. We will be keeping a very close eye in terms of the, uh, the plan to bring this forward. And we, in, 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 uh, similar to the Minister, would be very keen that that's, that that's uh, a, made a real priority, and given the fact that ground has been lost here as a result of you know, that ground needs to be and should be made up. So I thank you for your contributions, and I think we will be seeing you again, but good luck for now. And thank you. Chair and Committee, thank you very much. Uh, we'll specifically come back to the point on sleep-ins to yourself and the points you raised in relation to South Belfast, and I'm sure the um, uh, officials will remind us if there are any other points that we've committed to returning on. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, members, I think we'll take a, a comfort break there, maybe. Would we be OK to be back for 12? OK, members. Thank you. Um, we're now going to have a departmental briefing on the recommendations of the O'Hara report. Can I advise members that departmental officials are here today to brief the committee on the hyponatremia implementation programme? I refer members to the department's briefing papers at pages 169 to 194 of your pack. And I would like now to welcome Mr Conrad Kirkwood, Chairperson of the SAI Workstream Department of Health, Ms Donna Ruddy, Chairperson RQIA Remit Subgroup Department of Health, and Mr David Best, Chairperson Death Certification Workstream Department of Health. We would like to invite you now, uh, officials, please, to go ahead and brief the committee. Yep, uh, Chair, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to brief the, the committee in respect of the hyphen stream implementation. Um, you'll understand that implementing the recommendations goes somewhat beyond children and paediatric services as well. They'll have an impact across the full range of services and ages, and where possible, in thinking about implementation, we've tried to expand the scope to think in those terms. Um, you'll understand as well that the implementation needs to take account of steps that have to be in place to make sure that the changes become part of normal business, not just kind of stuff that we do when people are, you know, someone is looking. And everyone on the, on the programme uh, feels a sense of responsibility to make sure that it's something we sustain into the future. So I listened with interest, Chair, to your remarks in one of the sessions previously, a week or so ago, and it was, uh, you noted that the, the highlighted the importance of co-production. Um, co-production involvement has been an important part of this work. Over 200 members are involved in the programme, and they're as varied as service users, carers, uh, doctors, governance leads, voluntary sector staff, and even funeral directors. There's quite a, a, a sort of a varied group of people, and a great deal of time and effort has been put into orientation, induction, and research to make sure that all of those members, from wherever they come, have a common understanding of the issues in the background to support them in the work. And that takes time, but it delivers in terms of their understanding and their contribution to the work. And really what we're saying there is how we implement the, the recommendations for us is important, as well as the, the recommendations themselves. And we're hoping we can try and set a positive example in terms of how we engage and also learn lessons from what we're doing to speed up future co-production. 
without constraining the debate that there needs to be in what we're doing. Um, updates, uh, we've been keen to put uh, regular updates online. You may have seen them. The last one was, was in December. The next one is due in June. A feature of those is interviews with people who are involved in the various parts of the programme, whether they be service user carers or other members of the programme, and that's useful. Uh, they're unedited, and we'd like to hear what their views are. So the next one of those is due in June. Um, all of the work is guided by an involvement strategy, which outlines our co-production, and each individual work stream or subgroup uh, has an involvement plan as well as to how they reach out with the work that they're doing. Uh, Justice O'Hara put candor first in his report. Uh, we aim to provide proposals to the Minister later this month, and subject to his approval, and perhaps executive approval, will go out to consultation on those proposals. And there will be plenty of opportunities to continue to engage on the duty of candour and to tell us what people think in relation to the proposals. I should say um, it may require legislation, uh, and that legislation may uh, span more than one department. If there was a criminal sanction in relation to candour, it would require other departments to be involved. So it's, un it's likely to take time, and it would seem unlikely that the, the implementation of it would fall within this mandate, just to be aware. Uh, however, it's not something we need to stand still and wait. There's a lot we can do. And with that in mind, being open guidance through the Being Open subgroup will issue in the summer to promote a change in culture <coughs> and to try and promote openness in general and everything that is done. Um, it, the other aspect I'd like to talk about is the independent medical examiner. And to consider that role, a prototype has been carried out. And that essentially confirmed that we can use current electronic patient record systems uh, to access completed death certificates to allow a, a, an independent medical examiner to review cases. So we've done that, and a second prototype is underway at this moment to establish the practicalities of contacting the doctor who would have signed the death certificate so that we can then discuss that with them the case and to review the case. So this will give us a good understanding of the potential impact that such a review might have for families, and you wouldn't want to have any undue delay in the burial or committal process, because that would be quite distressing. Uh, in doing the work with the independent medical examiner, we've looked at models elsewhere, and those models look at a percentage of deaths or all deaths or only deaths in the hospital or sector. Ultimately, again, when we bring those proposals, it's likely that legislation will be required and that legislation would span as many probably as four departments. There are four departments who are involved in the death certification, the burial committal process. Uh, but the prototypes will give us a clear steer on where we're going from there. Serious adverse incidents, um, you'll be aware, you'll have maybe heard from the constituents, etc. Um, there are issues around serious adverse incidents and they cause concern. The purpose of a serious adverse incident is very much uh, to learn, to establish the learning and to share that learning. Uh, but bad communication can put loved ones and staff under a great deal of distress in what is an already very difficult situation. And with that in mind, we'll issue um, what you would expect if you're involved in a serious adverse incident review. We use the word review, not investigation, and that's a choice based on service user input in the group. And that's essentially a statement of patient rights. It's O'Hara's recommendation 37. And that will set out the rights that you would expect, and that will be incorporated into the SAI process, not just to support families, but to support the staff to help families through the process. Um, assurance. Um, but that was important to build an assurance process into our work. Uh, each work stream must produce an assurance framework which clearly maps out the definitions, what it is you're doing. Some words mean different things to different trusts and different parts of the service and also how the recommendation will be implemented regionally and consistently. Consistently, It's important that that's the case. And then finally, how it can be measured to prove that it has been implemented. And what we're saying, kind of, we try to put it simply, no recommendation will be considered as fully implemented until its implementation has been tested and proved over a sustained period of time. At this point, more than 70 actions have been through all three stages of the assurance process. 15 more will go through later this month, and we aim to pass approximately 60 of those recommendation actions to the Health Service for implementation between May and December. I've mentioned a couple of products already that we're working on, but other products will be coming out soon. A new guidance for the Directors of Arms Length Bodies will be launched in a conference in May, and we hope that will support Directors of Arms Length Bodies in terms of the quality and safety aspect of the work that they do, uh, so they can scrutinise and take assurance from trusts. There will be revised operating procedures for pathology services, and that somewhat builds on uh, Justice O'Hara's first report around pathology services some time ago, and it deals with consent to postmortems and matters around that. There will be publication of the principles of candour, and there will be new guidance for staff involved in the preparation of inquest and litigation. 
Just a couple more products. The online user feedback system will be launched in April 2020 and that will capture stories pretty much in real time from people who have experiences in the health and social care sector and allow us to get feedback from those. There will be some revisions then to the Department's assurance framework guidance for health and social care bodies and that will be strengthened. And lastly, clinical and social care governance. The guidelines for that will be reviewed, reinforced and reissued. Hope that gives you sort of a, it's pretty much you appreciate it's nine work streams, seven subgroups, there's a lot, a big variation in the work, but that's sort of a, a sort of a brief overview of where we are at this point, Chair, and happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. And I suppose before we go into questions, I know that I speak on behalf of the committee in relation to acknowledging the pain that, that this issue has caused for families. And I think in common with a number of other issues that have arisen where, where there are inquiries currently running, that those families are seeking accountability, but I have been hugely impressed with the level of a uh, commitment that they have to ensuring that there is genuine change within this, all of the systems that, that these inquiries cover. So I think I would just want at the outset to acknowledge, acknowledge the families in that respect. In relation to the RQA remit subgroup, um, there's reference to a review of the whole regulatory system. Can you elaborate on plans and timelines for that? Yes, um, I am the policy lead for that review within the department and uh, initially it started off as a review of the 2003 order which underpins the rules and remit of the RQIA and it was set up initially to address some gaps that had been identified um, but having engaged with stakeholders and I have to say this started in 2016-17 um, it was there was more more there was more than just the gaps. I think we needed. We decided we needed a fundamental review of regulation to bring it back to first principles. So we were looking at um, why do we regulate? Um, who would be within the scope of regulation? Because the current services that are regulated are named on the face of the 2003 order. Um, it excludes our primary care services. It excludes our our community trust services. It excludes our acute hospitals. And when we went out and spoke to people. People were surprised at that. So there were so. So we're looking at the, who, who we would regulate um, and then how we would regulate. And it would be, um, we're looking at be a, a, uh, an appropriate regulation, you know, depending on the risk. Now, I have a draft policy document. Um, the review is, being, is to be done in two phases. The first phase was what I've just talked about, you know, why we regulate scope and how. Um, and I have a draft policy document that, that I have to bring to Minister. For approval to go out to public consultation. If I get that and we go out to consultation and we agree the principles of regulation, then we would move on to phase two, which would we, we would look at the specifics of each service um, and determine the risk. Just sorry, Donald, before you, when are you expecting to come forward with phase one? When phase one, I would hope so by the summer. By this summer, you know, to go out to consult on this. You know, there's been a lot of engagement over, the, and that's why it has it has changed from what. It was initially thought, which was just a, a, like a review of the 2003 order. It's bigger than that. We're taking it back. It's a blank sheet approach to this, so it is. Um, and I'm hoping to go out in June to public okay. consultation. Again, it's subject to minister. I haven't had a paper to minister yet on that. Okay. And then phase two. Phase two. Um, now, because phase one, I phase one is it's quite big. You know, because we're bringing in all these, you know, we're, we're widening the scope, and we need to consult widely on that. So I was, I'm proposing to go out longer than the normal consultation period, which would, I'm, it would be the end of the year before I would have had. If, if we do get out in June, it would be the end of the year before we had finished consultation, analysed the results, and then would have had um, formed our policy on that, which would then enable us to move on to phase two, because I cannot move to phase two until we've completed and agreed, there's complete agreement on phase one. Phase two, I say we'll go into the specifics of, of the, the risks that are identified. We need to look at what other regulation is in place, what other assessment of risk is there, and then determine how then RQIA would, um, what they would add to the, to the assurance that is required. Because some, certain, like I, I've mentioned primary care, primary care, um, have their contract and the contract is managed by the board but we need to look is there anything else that is needed in terms of regulation from the RQIA you know and I, I don't know the answer to that yet because we haven't went out to do that and then once we've went through that the, that would the end of phase two would be changes to the legislation which could be a complete um, repeal of the 2003 order and a new act I, I don't know because it is so 
so new and we haven't gone out to, to consult on that stage yet. So again, it, it's, it's a few years before we would have le the legislation. I, um, I, would, I would suggest. And I suppose, Link, I, I, I understand that legislation is required for some recommendations, which make time frames more difficult to estimate. But what is the target date for full implementation of all the recommendations, or, or the non-legislative, all the non-legislative recommendations? What's your target for having those? In? Target for across the programme. Yes, I can give the. By September, we expect to have 60 of the recommendations implemented. Our actions rec recommended for those that require legislation. You are aware of the legislative timetable time at all. Uh, recommendations in between. It would be difficult to be precise, but if I was to give by way of some examples, some of the recommendations, uh, for example, in the paediatric work stream, there are recommendations there that we have resolved that the uh, new system in Compass that's coming into place begins to roll out from 2021. It doesn't. Uh, it's not big bang in every hospital. It goes on a phase basis, hospital by hospital. So we would want those five of the recommendations from the paediatric group will be part of that. So you could reasonably infer that the, the five recommendations wouldn't be fully implemented until the last trust goes live. So it, it's difficult to be precise in the way through. It's really a recommendation by recommendation basis. But by if you take it with 60 now, 15 more to go through as actions through assurance, that'll be essentially 75. There'll be actions out of the 120. We divide 96 recommendations into 120 actions so that we can work through them in the subgroups. We'd expect something of that number by late in the year. And give me an understanding of how you manage the trust's response to this, and your, your, do you set them targets, or how do you hold those, them accountable to come back with the, with the answers to you in a timely fashion? Which answers? Um, the recommendation, their work on the recommendation. So you said you said there that the trust, you know, you have a bit of uncertainty because you don't know what the trust will do. Um, the, no, there's, the trusts are involved in the groups on the way on the way through. There's trust involvement in most of the groups throughout the programme, and it's a co-production approach to what we're doing. So they will have fed into the into the solutions that we're developing. Um, in the event that we get to the point of having a solution agreed through that co-production process, there's several parts we do to it. Firstly, there are trust oversight committees. Each trust has one of those. They establish themselves uh, based on their own sort of preference, but largely they consist of members of the programme who are involved in different work streams that come from the trusts, and they look at the recommendations as a whole as we as we'll be putting them through to them. For each set of recommendations, we will have a directive from the department that will be based on what has been agreed by the work stream. We'll share it first with the trust oversight com committees to get a sense of uh, what is a realistic timescale by which they can implement, so we don't set them something that's entirely unrealistic, and also to allow them to give us a sense check. Uh, we would expect the trust oversight committees, whom we meet with every two months, to identify any other areas or concerns. There'll be some areas where there'll be already risks within the, in the, within the recommendations, and we'll have been working with the trusts through uh, various baselines that we carried out to make sure that any risks in there are managed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll go now to members and I have Gemma first, Paula, then Jerry at this stage. Thank you, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentation. Um, in terms of the independent medical examiner, what and in paragraph 18 it says about prototypes being considered, what are the different prototypes currently being undertaken and can you expand on what percentage of cases would be examined? Yes, um, obviously the independent medical examiner, the concept of that was based on Dame Janet Smith's um, recommendation for an independent medical examiner following the shipment inquiry. Um, so one of the issues and one of the big challenges that the independent medical examiner will have is quick access to the death certificate to enable that review to be done quickly so that there are no undue delays for the family and any uh, additional stress at a particularly difficult time. So the prototypes that we've undertaken at the minute involve an independent person, a, a doctor, a senior doctor, looking at the death certificate, which currently in hospitals is printed out electronically, uh, and the details of the death are recorded on what we have, uh, the regional mortality system. So the independent medical examiner at the minute has access to that and is currently able to see deaths as they come on live, so to speak. Um, as soon as the death certificate is completed, they appear on a list, and we're currently looking at that. Um, really to try and find the implications of getting the doctor. The whole purpose of the, of the review is to uh, ensure that the details of the, the stated cause of death are actually correct, uh, to ensure that cases 
um, that should have gone to the coroner or appropriately referred to the coroner, and that if there are any um, clinical governance issues or any care issues, that they can be identified and rectified at an early stage. So the prototype at the minute is actually looking at some of those deaths as they come on live, uh, a conversation with the doctor, and that discussion with the doctor is currently taking place. And w we have found thus far that actually trying to contact the doctor might be one of the most difficult things in terms of people certifying a death maybe at night and they go off at 7 o'clock in the morning, they're not back for two days or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of the issues. Yeah. So as we think ahead, we have a third prototype that we're uh, envisaging running from September until November of this year. And what we'll be doing at that uh, is, is likely to have, once there is a, a death um, that, that has occurred, that we will ask the certifying doctor to make contact with the independent reviewer in the first instance, and we will prototype that to see whether that cuts down gaps between the time the death has occurred and the certificate is reviewed. Because the most important thing in this is the family. And we want to ensure that the family doesn't uh, suffer undue uh, distress at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Paula. Oh, um, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to um, touch upon the SIA, SAI review sorry, of, and how you are actually going to be looking to amend those. I, I've, like probably all the MLAs around the table, have had constituents who have contacted me and they're very concerned about the nature in which they have been prepared and presented to them and um, they are concerned that sometimes the people who are involved in completing them are maybe in the independent sector, voluntary sector, and they're getting funded by the Department of Health, so they don't want to criticise the Department of Health and the reports and stuff. So I'm just wondering how you're going to make those a lot more robust, that whenever the families are presented with them, that they are really satisfied that a, a good body of work has been carried out into the review. Um. I think I should say I have the opportunity and I can, I'm permitted to talk in the public domain and the family gave me the permission to do so. Uh, I spoke with the Caudry family. Uh, it, was, it was a double homicide in relation to, the, to their parents. Um, it was a very productive meeting and in the course of the meeting they described the kind of difficulties that they had in the reviews of the SAIs in their case. Um, Having spoken to them, we carried out a mapping on the group in the workstream to see if some of the issues that they identified were issues that we'd either thought of before or were, that were being thought of elsewhere. And maybe if I talked through the, the rights that we're putting in the, the, what you would expect if you're involved in an SAI in part, and then maybe talk a little bit independence, it'll give you a flavour of where we are. Thank you. The rights basically should be listened, responded to and respected in a, a timely fashion, and they perhaps struggled with that initially. The openness, honesty, and empathy. And I recall that Charles Little, uh, he was one of the people in the, in the, the Cody case that he was leading, described that people should have intellectual curiosity in terms of the review of the investigation going forward. He was also very keen to stress that uh, he felt that if the chair of a review panel established what we refer to in our group as an engagement plan, something that sets out the contract between the review panel and the family as to how often you'd be in touch and how often you'd be in contact. Uh, service user occurs on our work stream would describe it that it's like a sort of Damocles hanging over you for a period of time where you're waiting for a phone call. You don't know if anything's going to happen and you're worrying. And the, the contract that was established with the Caudry family was that the chair would ring them every second week on a Friday whether anything had progressed mm -hmm. or not to give them that comfort. But we would describe that in our work as an engagement plan. A link person is a useful thing in the process. Uh, there's some videos that we've been shown from a family in the Southern Trust that we use in all of our engagement events, and that identifies the important nature of a link person who can signpost someone through the Trust and who can help them, because it's complicated and it's, it, it's very important to have a single point. They should have access to relevant information. People shouldn't feel in O'Hara language that you have to drag information out. Um, that you have the right to independence, advice and support, and indeed the Caudry family did ultimately access some independent advice and support from the Patient Client Council, which they find helpful. So it's those kind of things that were useful to them. In respect of the independence which you mentioned, there is a, 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 it would be described by some uh, families involved in cases that if the trust are paying for it, it's not truly independent. Uh, the Public Health Agency and the Health and Social Care Board are working closely with other policy officials in the department to look at other ways in which independence might be delivered. Uh, it might be that there might be a central pa panel of people who are at a remove from, from the trusts and that you would go through the, the board of the PHA to get those. Um, that is really going to be considered at the minute for level three serious adverse incident cases. That would be probably less than a dozen per year. 
but that's the, the thinking isn't precluding level two, which would be a, a bigger group of them. And the idea would be that the independent panel there be a, a much more a greater level of independence because the trust doesn't get to pick, if you will, and also greater um, thinking. It maybe it didn't, wouldn't have come necessarily through from the Caudry family, by my recollection, but certainly other information I've seen people were concerned that the review panel had adequate training for everything that they were trying to do, and that would be training for the chair, training to deliver difficult messages or to speak to people under difficult circumstances, training in investigative or review methods, root cause analysis, and also if you're bringing truly independent people who might be from beyond these shores, uh, that they're someone on the panel who can navigate the system for them and explain how our SAI system works, because it's subtly different than others, undoubtedly, and also how the health and social care system in Northern Ireland works, because we're an integrated system. So there's a lot of thinking around that, and it was very helpful to have spoken to families like the Caudry family, who shared their experience with us very fully and very constructively. Okay, thank you. And, and just um, the second part of this is in relation to the Child Death Overview Panel. Is that something you are able to give us an update on today? Yeah. Surely. Please. Um, the Child Death Overview Panel, we've been in contact with the Children's Commissioner, who has a, a strong interest in, in this matter. Um, essentially, um, we need to take account, firstly, O'Hara in Recommendation 88 referred to considering arrangements for a Child Death Overview Panel and looking as to what they might be. I think it's he, he, specific in his language. There's been a review of the Safeguarding, Bo Safeguarding Board in 2016, which would be essentially where this, this ought to be attached or could be attached would be a better way of describing it. Other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom have had a child death overview panel in operations for a while, and there are lessons to be learned from their experience of that. It's important that we do that. There's further work ongoing through the Public Health Agency and the Department, and there's been regular contact with the Children's Commissioner to try and move that issue forward. OK, because I, I just think people will be very disappointed if yes. at the end of this process we don't have it and there's another excuse for it. But um, I will watch with interest. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the, the, the comments. Um, and I want to join you, Chair, in supporting and paying tribute to the families um, you know, who are seeking justice and, and answers, but also I think, courageously trying to prevent something like this from happening again, which I think is, is a very important thing. I just uh, follow up quickly to Paula's last point um, on the Child Death Panel, because there seems to be um, a slowness to implement that. Is there any reluctance from the Department's uh, perspective to uh, proceeding with the Child Death Panel? The, the Department is engaging with the Children's Commissioner to work the solution towards it. There's no reluctance to work with. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just one other question, Chair. Um, do you think it's time for a, a Deputy Chief Medical Officer to oversee children's health care as a authority to ensure that they the highest level, um, at the highest level from the Department's perspective, to ensure that um, there's a, a clear channel of reporting uh, any potential cases like this again? So I was like to the, the ask, um, do you agree or would you uh, consider the effectiveness of a uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer specifically for um, children's health care? Thank you for the question. Um, I would describe it firstly, um, Deputy Chief Medical Officer would be responsible for giving professional medical advice and support to the department. Uh, children's health care is a very broad term, okay? And in the context of the inquiry recommendations, we're very much been fixing on it's not just a, you know, child, the, the report was important and it was about children and, and a sad loss. We're trying to set patient safety in the greater context. It should be patient safety right across all of the age groups. It's also uh, apparent in terms of the <coughs> definition of a child, depending on which legislation you're operating under, and there's several pieces of legislation, and depending on which services you're accessing, how someone describes a child and the age point at which you cut off in terms of the child differs. And indeed, um, in terms, when you move into the areas around uh, people with a learning disability, young people, young people with a learning disability, there's also a transition period where they wouldn't, perhaps their family may not consider them entirely as a, an adult yet, even though they might be beyond 19. So the approach of the department is to identify very clearly the patient safety element for everyone under a deputy chief medical officer and to make that a locus for all patient safety issues. And we're going to, to recruit a deputy chief uh, medical officer at present on that basis. Sorry, just to clarify, for ch uh, childcare, for, 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 for it's patient safety for patient. all ages. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Sinead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. And I would like to add my words also to the families uh, behind this. It's hard reading when you know the experiences that have led to it. Um, in terms of the recommendations, there are some that are specifically um, within the office of the department, um, and if you could speak to those, and um, you know there are, I suppose, 
difficult to call them easy reach um, recommendations, but because I know how difficult it is to recruit consultants at this time. But are there assurances that you can offer us that today what is happening on wards that people can get some comfort by? Um, do you want me to set that question specifically yeah, in paediatric units? And, yeah. Yeah, okay, no issue. Um, in terms of the paediatric work stream, it placed its focus very clearly early on in recommendations that it considered to be of the highest priority. It was relating to age-appropriate care. In respect of children, children who might have surgery in an adult ward in the district general hospital as opposed to moving to the Royal Belfast Hospital for sick children, and the um, cooperation and, and work that needs to happen between the surgeon and the paediatrician in those cases. It goes beyond. It, it, entirely, probably O'Hara focused on the prescription of intravenous fluid, which really requires a paediatrician in those circumstances, but it goes beyond that as well. The recommendations under the paediatric session, you're right to say that they're more operational by nature. I think that's what you were saying. Mm -hmm. um, how we've looked at them, there was the department's paediatric strategy was published in 2016. It was recently reviewed by RQIA, and it kind of sets out some of the some of the direction that we need to travel anyway. Um, the way I would describe those recommendations, and I'm not sure if this is how O'Hara meant them, but it seems to me that there are a series of recommendations that intend to deliver regional consistency across all paediatric units and wards, clarify roles and responsibilities and accountability so we're sure who's in charge and when and where, and that there are multiple opportunities. Uh, the, the management of the deteriorating child is a very difficult thing for medical professionals to do. Uh, oftentimes it might be the parents who notice a, a, a rapid deterioration or improvement first. And it's about, I think O'Hara's recommendations 10 through 30 are very much about creating as many opportunities as possible for medical professionals to engage with families and engage with parents, and also opportunities for parents to find medical professionals to engage with them. If there's an issue, they'd be things like a consultant of a week in a paediatric setting, that there's always somebody who's in charge that they can go to. Uh, we found a very useful project in the course of our work uh, in one of the trusts, which is around paediatric bedside handover by nurses, which is proved very, very important. And it captures what parents have to say about their child. Um, in terms of the, the safety element and the managing risk element, which you had at the start, we carried out a baseline very soon after uh, the establishment of the implementation programme to satisfy ourselves that uh, risks were being managed, if there were any, whilst we were in the process of developing the recommendations further. Thank you. Uh, and to just one minor point. Um, just for clarification, you mentioned that you were extending down of the consultation process. To I meant the, the timeline, because yes. normally we go out for eight weeks yeah. to consult. Um, I, my intention is to go out for longer, but again, I have to seek Minister the approval. Okay, to, so what to, are you thinking, 12 weeks? I think in 12 at least, okay. because of the wide range of stakeholders that we have to engage with, which is those services that are not currently regulated by the RQIA, that it would come within the scope of what we think regulation should cover. Um, so it was just to extend it, and also I'm mindful that it'll be running over the summer. You know, it yeah, will, uh, yeah. just another consideration. Yeah. Appreciate that, thank you, Chair. But I have, um, I would be welcome. You know, if the committee wanted to come and give a briefing on on the review of where we are to date um, and what our intentions are, separately, if you would like. Thank you. I just want to revert uh, back to the issue that Paula raised around the SAIs, and you'd mentioned about a link person, Conrad. Is that is that link person um, mandated at present? Is, is it does everyone get a link person, or is it something that happens? It's not mandated in policy from the department at present. It's something that some trusts do. Uh, the, the best example we had was one in the Southern Trust, where someone was a link person for a family who were under very difficult circumstances, and who provided them with signposts around the trust. I should say as well, it works. Uh, there are probably three roles that, that all help. There's the bereavement officer who will deal with someone who suffered a loss initially, and there's bereavement officers in each of the trusts. There's, we will be looking to have a link person in each of the trusts to support them with the signposting, and also working towards through the user experience and advocacy group, the idea that it would be a positive offer of advocacy very early and upfront, not we'll give you a piece of documentation about advocacy through the patient client council, or whatever, rather that someone will make a call and, and we'll try and help you through the process as well. Uh, I was probably struck by the Caudry family, who were very articulate and intelligent and worked their way through the system very successfully. I think the challenge to us as a system is in providing advocacy that everyone can navigate their work through the system to the same extent. And I, and I think that is a crucial point. I, th I would like to see that being brought in as a, as a requirement because I know from my own experience in terms of dealing with uh, some of the high profile, one, one in particular of the, of the high profile inquiries that are going on at the present time, 
It took me six months to find out which thrust had done the, the SAI. It was actually referred to as an SCR. There was, there was a number of thrusts. And I had been coming from previous experience of working in, in the system as a social worker, and I struggled. And I have, a, and I, I just, I suppose that's for noting. The other thing that I would note is that I am also aware of another case where the professional who was the subject of the SAI was the person who reported back to the family on the outcome of the SAI. And I think that's absolutely unacceptable. I think it's inappropriate. I think it challenges the whole independence of the SAI process. And I think those things need to be considered. So I think a link person who is acting in the role of advocate and enabler and facilitator for families is, it would be a hugely beneficial thing to bring forward. Thank you. Um, and I just could, could I ask you just to speak up for Hansard. It can be quite hard. I do apologise. It can be quite hard just to hear in this room at times, so we all struggle a little with that. The other thing then I want to, to uh, ask you about is in terms of the duty of candour, where that's at at present, how, how you've gone about engaging in that work and what the plans are from this point forward. Um, this will take a, a little while, if that's OK. okay. Um, in terms of the duty of candour, um, work so far, uh, there have been eight research papers. Um, that was I talked earlier about co-production and the need to ensure that everybody has a common understanding of what is meant by duty of candour or what could be meant of it. I think in the early days we had people who were very uh, vocally opposing the duty of candour, even though we hadn't yet defined what we felt that meant in, in our jurisdiction. Uh, from those eight papers, there were a number of key learnings that we got from that. Uh, we went out then publicly for calls for evidence for people to tell us, the various professional bodies, regulators, etc. We carried out an exercise to identify the legislation uh, and the legal position as well as the human rights position. So there's quite a lot of work around that, which is largely about us getting information. In terms of the people we've spoke to, uh, we had engagement across events across all of the trusts. We have spoke at all kinds of events, the British Medical Association, British Dental Association. We've been engaging with trust boards, trust oversight committees. Anywhere that anybody will listen to us talking about candor, we're, we're going to talk to them about it. There's been quite a big exercise around involvement and engagement, and we took uh, information that people responded to us online in respect of the calls for evidence. I think um, we've got to the point where it's about being open as well. Um, it, it, the being open work can be carried out in advance of a duty of candour being implemented if we get that far. And that's about changing the culture. It's about making open this more routine, promoting that, trying to share the learning and to support service users to speak up if they have an issue to try and make that more possible. Um, we looked at other legislation. Um, Wales essentially is a system of regulation. They haven't moved to legislation yet. That's probably around 2022. England implemented theirs in 2015 following the Francis report. Uh, there was no individual duty of candour attached to that, and they essentially went for a model of what they would describe as enhanced professional regulation. There are already professional regulatory codes for doctors, nurses, etc., that would encourage them in the idea that they should have candour. Scotland implemented their duty of candour in 2018. It's a little different from ours. It, it, we might think of it doesn't it consider near misses. And in the south, they had a mandatory open disclosure policy. They're going to or an open disclosure policy rather. They're going to make that mandatory by way of legislation. Their individual duty though won't. The sanction won't apply to the individual. Rather, it will apply to the organisation. So there's a big difference in how people are doing things. In terms of sanctions, there's lots of sanctions before you would get to a criminal one, and we have to consider those. It could be training and support initially, it could be performance review, it might be a disciplinary action, then moving on to professional regulation, and then ultimately a criminal sanction. We also were interested as to what thresholds might look for that, because um, you, know, you wouldn't expect to be uh, sanctioned for a duty of candour for making a mistake. Uh, you, know, you might make a mistake in the course of your, your work, you need to learn from that. The idea of the duty of candour is that you shouldn't cover that up or withhold information in relation to it. So we looked to where there were other thresholds and found that really how other jurisdictions describe harm is inconsistent. They've all got different levels, whether it's serious, moderate, prolonged psychological harm. And that pretty much ties into the model of clinical and social care governance that they have in, in England, Scotland, Wales or wherever. And we need to map our clinical social care governance to what a new threshold might look like. That's quite complex. Um, also, other jurisdictions, their legislation is subtly different. Don has already talked about the RQIA's legislation in terms of the duty of quality. Um, other jurisdictions, they, they will apply um, different organisations required to be reg registered under law, so there's a big, big difference. Really, O'Hara sums it up quite nicely in terms of um, what one of the 
comments that he makes in the report, he says all that's required is that people be told honestly what has happened and legally enforceable duty of candour will not threaten those whose conduct was appropriate. And that kind of nails it in terms of the thinking. The five principles that we're looking at around uh, the being open uh, guidance that's coming out is it should be routine candour in everything that we should do. That uh, we should, there should be candour where we have a near miss and it's something we need to learn from. There should be candour when something goes wrong, when there's been a loss, there's been a death, and that there should be adequate support in place to allow that candour to happen and governance arrangements in to make sure it should happen. So there's been quite a lot of work around that. In terms of describing O'Hara's um, recommendation and how our legislation might look, it would go further than anybody else's in terms of if it was, if it was an individual duty with a criminal sanction. It would not be limited to harm would link very closely to culture and openness and the, the Be and Open subgroup and the Duty of Candor group are working closely. They do all of their consultations together. We need to avoid, avoid unintended consequence. We don't want to discourage people from wanting to work in the health service. So we need to be careful there. And we need also to be mindful there are existing. O'Hara described it that he had to drag the truth out in some cases and he found that difficult. There are already offences uh, that aren't part of a duty of candour, but are to do with withholding information, and that's around freedom of information, the Inquiries Act, and indeed the requirements under the Coroner's Act for inquests. So there is existing legislation out there. Um, it's really about, I think the whole thing is about listening, tell the truth, and being compassionate in terms of what we're doing, the being open element of it. So I think that's kind of a broad brush sort of in the background of candour. The options going forward, we haven't coalesced on a single option yet. Uh, the group is still working through where they will go with that, and it would be wrong for me to preempt what the, the candour group might decide in the next week or so, but it could be that it, the options would be something like a duty of candour with a sanction criminally, a duty of candour without one, a duty of candour with a criminal sanction around withholding of information. There may be others. Sorry. I just want to very quick um, um, to ask you about how you are learning and interacting with the independent panel into the neurology recall in terms of some of the, their findings and their learning around sharing information and, and bringing it forward to the relevant people? We would be aware, really, in terms of the responses they would ask us for information that we would provide them. We'd be aware as to, you know, the sort of information that they're asking for would give us some insight into their thinking. We we'll look forward to what the report is in terms of the outcome and where we're going with that ultimately and take that into account as it comes up. Um, yeah, I, uh, we have heard at committee previously that uh, concerns around an individual duty of candour at the, being at the expense of holding the organisation to account. What's your view on that? Um, at the expense of work? Yeah, so, so that rather than locating it with an individual duty of candour, that that in some ways may allow the organisation to not be as responsible. I think it would be wrong of me to say my view on that, it's a view of the work stream and they're going to work through those options over the next week or so and put those to the Minister. There is no, the, the group hasn't coalesced as yet and haven't formalised their proposals. I'd be wrong to preempt, and I shouldn't interfere with what they're doing and their work coming forward. That's the principle of how we've established the group. And I think, you know, I think again, as a committee, I think we are very conscious of the need to support staff um, in, in terms of, but I don't think it, it necessarily needs to be something that's just to the detriment of staff. I think good, good calendar, good culture can provide staff with the reassurance that it is okay to come forward. And, say, and I do think, again, on the range of issues that we're dealing with here, not only just linked to hyponatremia, that we do need to see a very, very quick turnaround in terms of people being able to get the information, accurate information, in a timely fashion, and in a way that supports them and, and rather than adds to their to their grief and stress and, and distress. So, listen, I think that's us at the end of our session. I thank you for coming along and uh, providing your briefing and the answers. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members, we're now moving into the uh, SR, SR 2020 forward slash 17, the Mental Capacity Research Amendment Regulations NI 2020. And I refer members to pages 196 to 206 of the pack. This SR provides a specific list of those who can act as appropriate bodies for the purposes of approving research under the Mental Capacity Act 2016. We considered this SR at our meeting of the 6th of February and agreed to defer its decision to seek further information from the Department. The Department's response is included at pages 204 and 205 of the pack. 
The examiner of statutory rules advises that the SR is in breach of the 21-day rule, but that the examiner is content with the Department's reason for this and has no other issues to raise. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? Okay, can I then, if not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 17, the Mental Capacity Research Amendment Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the rule? Are we agreed? Agreed. Um, we're moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 19. The provision of health services to persons not ordinarily resident amendment revocation regulations NA 2020. We considered this SR at our meeting on 20th of February and agreed that it had no objection to the rule, subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. The examiner has since advised that she has no issues to raise. Her report is included at pages 572 to 578 of the pack. Are members content to note that the examiner of statutory rules has no issues with the technical elements of the SR? Content. Okay, moving on to SL1, the provision of health services to persons not ordinarily resident, amendment regulations NA. And I refer you members to pages 209 to 211 of your pack. The department here is proposing to make a statutory rule to enable visitors to the north to receive hospital treatment for coronavirus disease free of charge. This is to ensure that the risk to public health from symptomatic visitors is minimised. The SR is proposed to come into operation as soon as possible after health committee approval is given and is subject to negative resolution. Are members content that the department makes this statutory rule? We are happy to support um, the Department making this rule. Just a note, I have contacted yourself about I think we should um, seek more meetings with the Department about um, its support and also scrutinising its, its response to the coronavirus. And I know we are meeting the, the Minister next week, but just to put that um, yeah. on the minutes. Sure. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and I think that's, that's uh, worthy of note. And also, I think um, we would acknowledge the swift action of the Department and the Board in bringing forward practical and pragmatic um, measures such as this in, in the time that we face. And I am very conscious that the Minister is appearing next week, and I think we will all be uh, seeking to you know, question in terms of what the Department plan to do at that point in time and into the future. So, so are members content that the Department makes the statutory rule? Yeah, content. Content. Yeah. Thank you. SR 2020-23. The Public Health Notifiable Diseases Order, NA 2020. So I refer members to pages 213 to 219 of the pack. This SR makes coronavirus a notifiable disease, which means that medical practitioners will be required to share patient information with the public health agency if they are aware a patient is infected with the disease. The committee considered and approved the SL1 policy document for this rule at our meeting on 27 February 2020. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this rule. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? So therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 23 the Public Health Notifiable Diseases Order, NA 2020, and it has no objection to the rule subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, now moving on to correspondence. And can I turn your attention to pages 220 to pages 589 and to the correspondence memo at pages 3 to 5 of your table papers? I'd like to draw your attention, members, to several items. First of all, item 11.5 is a departmental response regarding IVF treatment for females close to the age threshold for treatment, stating that the Minister is establishing a working group on the NDNA commitment, but that he could not yet provide a time frame for implementation. Are members content to note the Department's response for now and follow up uh, in, the, in, the, in the aftermath of Easter, just to see where that's at? Yes. Content? Okay, thank you. 
Item 11.6 at pages 236 to page 307 of the pack is a copy of the second progress report on the autism strategy 2013 to 2020. Um, do members of the panel? Yeah, Chair, um, I wonder if could we revisit this um, particular item? Uh, there's quite a large document and I certainly have some um, issues with some of the content of it, but I'd rather um, get that information uh, brought back to the clerk that we could look at it again, maybe with, uh, so we could maybe ask some questions of the department concerning the strategy. Okay, and, and would you propose then to liaise with the clerk and bring bring the letter back to the committee for approval yeah, by the committee for further? That would be great with the committee's the permission. Members content with yeah, that? Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Uh, item 11.8 at page 310 of the pack is a departmental response providing further information on issues arising from the departmental evidence session on elective waiting times on 6th of February. It includes further information on costs to tackle the waiting list backlog, nursing, workforce vacancies, the review of maternity obstetrics and neonatal services and communication with mental health patients. I found that the, I, I, I thought in my reading of the correspondence it was still difficult to, to figure out exactly what the, uh, the department, what the outcomes were going to be versus the money it would be spent in terms of resources. So are members content to note the department's response for now but that we, we, uh, can, can we seek further clarification that Eilish, maybe in terms of further breakdown? I, I found it a bit high level still. I don't know if members agree with that, but would you be content for us to write back for further clarification? Yeah. yeah. Um, we could also seek to alert the department that um, you wish to quote this further at the next budget briefing. Yeah, I think that would be. That's not that far. I think that would be maybe that might be the best course of action, just because I think we want to get a, a fuller understanding of that. Yeah. So, uh, are members otherwise content with the proposed actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Uh, uh, thank sorry, you. just a wee second. I, I hadn't yeah. realised this was on the table papers as opposed to our main papers. I'm just wondering what's happened with the mesh letter that came through. Um, well, oh, forward work programme. That's yeah, fine. We, we have put it in the forward. We're, we're, we're looking to bring the, those, that group to, the, uh, to one of our meetings on 30th of April. Okay. No, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So moving on then to the forward work programme, can I refer members to the draft forward work programme in table papers at pages 581 and 592 of your pack? Are members content to note the forward work programme? Content. Content. Thank you. And then any other business? Do members have any other business today? Chair, I just wanted to go back to next week. We have the ministerial briefing, and it, I think it's probably allocated an hour there. I'm just wondering, is that going to be enough to get through all the issues that members will raise? Yeah, we could extend that. It's oh, just, yeah. uh, just this you're... last week, for example, Naomi was there, the Justice Minister was there for three, were three hours, and I think that people really were you know, really appreciated that they were able to maybe ask three or four questions because there's just so much yeah. that we really, you know, and I appreciate the format we have at the moment, we, we would restrict it to, but I think that this is maybe one that we would probably appreciate a longer session. Can you? I'll yeah. with the chair on that then. Thank yep. you. Okay. Yep, that's accepted. And date, time and place of next meeting then. The next meeting will take place at 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, 12th of March, 2020 in the Senate Chamber here in Parliament Buildings. Thank you, members. The meeting is now closed. Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber.